G'day kids, thanks for tuning in to another Aussie episode. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button and that way you won't miss out on any of the new videos we put out and it would certainly make my day. In the meantime, enjoy this video. Aussie, 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 oi. Aussie is a friend of yours and he's a friend of mine. G'day kids, Ozzy here. Now today we are in for an incredible treat. We're chatting to the amazingly talented Ellie Cole, the most successful Australian female Paralympian of all time. A four-time Paralympic swimmer, Ellie has won an impressive 17 Paralympic medals and she's an absolute inspiration. She was also the flag bearer at the Tokyo Paralympic Games, showing that Ellie is more than just a successful athlete. Now this chat is fun, it's inspiring, and it's everything we ever wanted these conversations to be. A living example that anything is possible with the right amount of courage, belief, and persistence. So come on kids and grown-ups, let's meet Ellie Cole and find out just how she achieves so much success and how she likes to stay keen. G'day Ellie, Ozzy here, how are you? I'm fabulous. How are you? I'm absolutely amazing. I am so honoured to have you on the chat today with Ozzy. Super excited to, to talk to you and learn a bit more about your story and inspire all the kids out there. Thank you for having me on. I really love chatting to kids. I work as actually as a swim coach, so I work with kids all the time. Excellent. I remember being one myself. It wasn't that long ago, so I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well. As I said, Ellie, you, um, I reckon you're pretty much a household name around the country and around the world these days. But for those kids that don't know you, Ellie, you are an Australian Paralympic swimmer and a very successful swimmer, I might add, as part of the Aussie Paralympic team. And you've just recently returned home from competing at the Tokyo Paralympics. So Ellie, I want to take it right back to the start. How did you choose swimming and what age were, were you when you first tried it? Well, I've always loved to swim. Um, I'm sure most kids do. Uh, I started swimming when I was just three years old and it was for rehabilitation after I got sick from cancer and the doctors, they had to take my leg away. And so for me to learn how to use my body again, I started swimming <laughs> and funnily enough, I went around in circles for quite a few weeks. Um, but I just wanted to keep up with my friends and enjoy the water with my friends and um, went through the learn to swim program like most kids do. And then on the other side of that, I just started competing in swimming and I was competing against kids that had two arms, two legs, and I was the only one there that had a disability, um, but I wanted to win anyway. And so that gave me a really competitive edge that took me through to my first Paralympics when I was 16, I was when I, when I competed at my first Paralympics. Amazing, Ellie, that's, uh, that's inspiring. So for the kids that don't know, you're a childhood cancer survivor. Um, and as a result of the treatment for your sarcoma, uh, you had to have your right leg amputated uh, above the knee. But um, then as rehabilita rehabilitation, as you said, you got into the pool, started swimming, obviously fell in love with it. Um, what is it about swimming that you love? For me, like when I was younger, it was a bit more of an equalizer. I knew that I was very different from the other kids um, and that necessarily wasn't a bad thing. But, you know, back in the 1990s, when you had it, when you have a disability, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, you were treated quite differently. It's, it's a bit different now, which is wonderful. But back when I was younger, you know, a lot of adults and a lot of my teachers wouldn't think that I was actually very capable. And so for me, like swimming was just a way where I could be the same as all of my friends. I could get in the water, I could take my prosthetic leg off and I would just have like the freedom of the water there and it was just me in the water. And it had nothing to do with who I was outside of the pool, it had nothing to do with my capabilities. Um, and then before I knew it, I was beating everybody that had two arms and two legs and it was a way where I could feel like I could be a champion and it was a way where I built a lot of confidence um, in sport and that's why sport's such a wonderful thing to get involved in. Um, and it was really great socially for me as well. Like, you know, I was training four times a week. Um, on Saturdays, we'd all have breakfast together after and, you know, I still do that at 30, you know, <laughs> with my squad now. So um, I really enjoy the, the sense of community as well, I think. 
Amazing. Well, um, hats off to you. You obviously got a, a lot of natural talent being able to beat um, the able-bodied kids with, with two legs and two arms. And you, you've got a, um, a bit of a, not a, they've got a head start because they've got the two arms and two legs. You've got the just the one leg. So um, let's just talk about how many years of hard work. As you fast forward now, you're a four-time Paralympian. Yeah. How many years of hard work got you to this point? You said you went to your first Paralympics at 16. Um, just for the kids out there, how many you know, times are you training a week? How many hours a day? Yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, I think when you're younger, you don't really think of being a professional athlete as like a full-time job when you leave school. Um, you know, even when we were at school, we were training um, nine times a week and our training sessions would be two hours in the pool. Um, and then on top of that, you know, strength sessions as well. And then when you leave school, you know, that nine times a week stays the same, but you're doing um, more extra training. So you're doing like Pilates and you're, you're spending time with dietitians, and you're spending time with physiotherapists, just trying anything to make your swimming better. Um, and so all in all, I think I spent about six hours a day on my training. Um, and that's 360 days of the year. We really only get the week of Christmas off. Wow. Um, and then you've got to think, if you're in a sport that's only at Olympic or Paralympic Games, you only really get to compete in front of the whole globe like every four years. And so you're putting in all of those hours day in, day out for year upon year, and you only race maybe one minute in the, that four year period. And so that's a lot of pressure on yourself in trying to make that one minute as best you can. Yeah. And so I think, you know, that's why I really enjoy swimming. It's like, a lot of work for a split second result. Um, but it's kind of like you find more joy in the process of the training rather than getting to the end and putting it all together. It's kind of like that daily improvement and that constant strive to improve every day is the bit that makes me come back for more. Excellent. So it's setting small goals along the way to your bigger goal, which is your your competitive races at um, you know Commonwealth Games or Paralympics events. Yeah, small, like small goal setting is so important. You know, I remember being a young girl and I remember I wanted to be a gold medalist, but I didn't really set myself a plan on how to get there. You know, and it was quite a, a big goal that seemed pretty unachievable when I was 10 years old. And it did take a lot of years to get there, but every single day that I went to the pool, I would make sure that I would leave and I was better at anything, like something. It didn't even have to be something big, it could have just been, you know, I did an extra dolphin kick off my underwater streamline, um, but just something that made me a better swimmer than when I got there. And I've been doing that for 16 years and I still have that same um, approach to my training as I did when I was younger. It's just that I've been doing it for such a long time that I've improved a lot of those skills. And that's how you, you get really good at something. You just improve something every day. Amazing. It's very inspiring to hear that, that you're still looking for improvements, even though you, you've made it to the top of your sport. You still can find improvements every day, every training session, uh, and that uh, amounts to, to gold medals and yeah. uh, Paralympic medals. <laughs> it does get like more challenging as you get older because yeah. your body recovers in such a different way when you're 30 compared to when you're like 15 years old. But that's also the fun and the challenge. You know, things don't always work the same um, year after year after year. You know, your body changes, your experience changes, your priorities change. And so it's about you like trying to figure out how to make the pieces of the puzzle work again. Yeah. And that's all That's all the fun of it as well. Like it's all pretty enjoyable, really. <laughs> yeah, great. Now, what would you say to young kids that are suffering a similar sickness that, that you had as a kid or any kind of disability? that want to get into swimming and start doing it competitively. What would you, what would your message be to them? I think there is certainly a way for anybody to get involved. It doesn't necessarily matter, you know, what your background is, what your like family financial situation is, what your location is. You know, there's always a way for you to be involved in sport. There's always a way for you to build a community around sport. You know, even if you don't have like a, a football field down the road from you. you you can get a group of friends together and you can you know knock a you can knock a can around with hockey sticks um but i think the main premise of sport is that you really need to just enjoy yourself you need to find your people to get together with and just have a good time um and so regardless of you know what your background is what your physical cap capabilities are there are always people out there that are going to want to join in with you there are always people out there that are going to want to help you and it may not seem like it at the time. You might have to go out of your box a little bit and try and find those people, try and source those people. But trust me, if anybody wants to play sport with me, I'm there for you. Ah, that's amazing. 
Now, Ellie, growing up as a as a as a child with um, one prosthetic leg, um, I heard you developed many skills as a youngster, including the silent ninja hop. Can you tell me what that is? <laughs> I've never really spoken about the ninja hop before. I can see you've done your research. So, when I was a young girl, I used to. Um, I used to like have my bedroom in the downstairs area and then upstairs was where like the kitchen was but next to the kitchen was a living room and so I used to go to bed and then I would get hungry during the night because I'm a swimmer and swimmers eat a lot of food and so I would have to kind of hop past the living room to get to the kitchen right. and my parents are always in there watching TV so I had to like develop this ninja hop so I could get around my house without them hearing because usually when people hop they make like a big thudding noise and you can yeah. hear them from the whole house and so I developed this like ninja hop where when you do a hop you kind of like um land on the on almost like right near your toes and you just kind of roll your foot down and like let your foot just slowly absorb that sound <laughs> and so I don't know if I can do it anymore because I broke my foot a few years ago all right but I think after I get off this call I'm gonna see if I, I've still got it in me see if I can still <laughs> do the ninja hop <laughs> Oh, I love it. I, I want to find out if you can. Um, if we could pull back the camera and, and get that on shot, that'd be amazing. But we're not going to put you on uh, on the spot right now. But for the kids out there, hey, go and try the uh, the Silent Ninja Hop. See if you can do I it. I would love people to start tagging me in Silent Ninja Hops. Hashtag Silent Ninja Hop. Yeah, we can get something going here. <laughs> do you have any other special hopping skills that you learned as a child? Um, I've got exceptional balance because I've had to learn to balance a lot over my lifetime. But yeah, like I mentioned, I broke my foot about three or four years ago. And so I do struggle a little bit more than I used to. But um, no, I could, I could hop all day. I could balance all day. I can do a silent ninja hop. You know, I could be standing and you could throw something really heavy at me and I could catch it and not fall over just on yeah. one leg. Um, I don't know, you kind of just, Whatever life gives you, you kind of just learn how to adapt with it. <laughs> Great message. Awesome. Now, I believe you're lucky enough to now have a waterproof prosthetic leg. How has that changed your life? And did you think it would affect your life as, as much as it has? Um, it's changed my life pretty considerably. You know, I'm a swimmer. I'm around the water all of the time. And when I was growing up on my prosthetics, um, they went very high tech. They were basically just a door hinge. And I had to be really careful around water because if I got any moisture in the hinge, then it would rust and it would kind of just, it wouldn't end well. Um, and then it was really unfortunate because I used to go camping every year with my family at Christmas time. And my favorite thing to do was to be next to the river. And I would just spend all of my days by this um, watering hole. And like my brothers and sisters would all be like walking around trying to find like fish or anything that they could. And I would just have to kind of sit on the side and watch them. And I always dreamed of just wading in the water, just walking in the water with them. And I didn't really get that opportunity until I was in my mid twenties um, and prosthetics started developing and the technology started developing. And yeah, I got my first waterproof leg. And I remember I went down to the beach and cause all I wanted to do is walk in water for the first time. And I was just walking like along right, right where the water's edge was. And I had the biggest smile in my face. And I remember looking around and there were all of these just general members of the public that didn't realize that I wanted had wanted to walk in water for 25 years. And it was like the very first time I was doing it. And they were probably looking at me being like, why is this girl so happy? <laughs> why is she like so elated at just walking in the water? But it was a really big moment for me. Um, and it was really cool. What a beautiful moment too. Uh, and just to, to be able to appreciate those seemingly small things that, that able-bodied people take for granted. Um, yeah, I think there's like a real lesson in Paralympic sport with just taking things for granted. You know, I think the moment I walked in water for the first time, that just goes to show like we, we do take small things for granted. Um, you know, like two years ago, I remember I got a really bad migraines for like six months and I was like, what if I never feel, I remember thinking, what if I never feel better again? And then once my migraines cleared, I was like, oh, I'm never taking just having like a clear head for granted ever again, or my health for granted ever again. And it's almost like you wait until it's too late before you start wishing that you had what you had before, if that makes sense. It does. Um, and so, yeah, the Paralympics really puts things into perspective when you see the other athletes. And that's what I love so much about the Paralympics. Yeah, it's an it's it's inspiring, um, and I certainly loved watching it. And I lockdown, I suppose, in Australia is probably quite fortunate in the timing because it gave us 
um, certainly in, in Sydney and different parts of Australia, the opportunity to to slow life down and actually watch a lot of Olympics and Paralympics. So hopefully kids can appreciate and, you know, chats like this, they can start to understand that, you know, there's so many lessons to be taken from people like yourself. There is. And, you know, like I was in Australia still when the Olympics were on. And so I got to see all of my friends because I've grown up with a lot of the athletes, you know, competing on this world stage. And usually when an Olympic Games is on, I read the news and sometimes the news is really positive and sometimes it's really negative because there's this really high expectation for the athletes to win gold medals. And it was kind of nice in Tokyo because the public were just so proud of all of the athletes for just getting there. You know, <laughs> the games were postponed for a year. Um, we didn't know if it was going to go ahead, but we kept working as hard as we could anyway. And then, I don't know, people had this new appreciation for the athletes for just getting to the starting line. And I kind of understood that everyone, or everybody else understood that that's really like what the whole idea of the Olympics and Paralympics is about, you know, it's about that triumph before you even get to the starting line. Like you should be proud regardless of what the result is just for um, committing to something for so long, for working as hard as you can at such a high level, like that excellence that it takes. Um, and then, yeah, it's almost like the competition was the reward for all of that. And it was like the celebration for all of that. Well said. Um, I know from an outsider looking in, um, I just think that yourself and all the, the Paralympians and Olympians, just for making it to that world stage, you've already won. You're already winners um, for, as you said, going through the process and, and achieving goals along the way to get you to the Olympics. Anything else that happens while you're there is a bonus. Now for you, you haven't done it once, twice, three times. You've done it four times. You're a, a four-time Paralympian. Yes. A huge, <laughs> huge effort. But what's even more impressive is that over your Paralympic career, you've won 17 medals, six gold, five silver and six bronze. Correct. Now, Don't this actually makes, you. yeah, yeah, I've done my research, but this actually makes you the most successful Australian female Paralympian of all time. Yeah, it does. How does that make <laughs> you feel? Um, the same as before I was the most successful female Paralympian. I feel honestly exactly the same. Um, I feel exactly the same as my first Paralympics. Like when I approached my first Paralympic Games, I just really wanted to enjoy the experience and do the best that I could. And it was the same at Tokyo. I just wanted to enjoy the experience and do the best that I could. The message was exactly the same. Um, it's just that over that 16 year period of the four games, Sometimes there were medals waiting, it's sometimes there weren't medals waiting. And I just had done it for so long and, and entered so many events <laughs> that at the end of 17 of those races, there was a medal there for me. But, you know, if if there was only three medals waiting for me, if there was zero medals waiting for me, I, I'd still be just as proud of myself. And I think um, that's the real message there. And I didn't even know that I was going for the greatest of all time, female Paralympian of all time, until like, the day before the competition started. Wow. <laughs> Someone just mentioned it to me and I was like, whoa, that's actually putting a lot of pressure on me. But I just sat back and enjoyed the moment again. And yeah, I won myself two medals in Tokyo and that took me to the 17 that I needed to get the title. It's such a beautiful answer, Ellie. And it's just, it sums you up as a person that, you know, that that is not the pinnacle and it's not what it's all been about for you. It's all about the process. And, you know, the, as you said, the medals are, it's a bonus. It's the, it's the cream on top and it's all about the process and, and, and making it to the Paralympics. So hats off to you. But there has to be, is there a, fa a favourite medal out of those 17? Yes, <laughs> there's still a favourite. Yep. Um, my favourite was in Rio, uh, the 2016 Games, so 2016. Um, I, I won the 100 metre backstroke at that Games, but um, to, to fl flash back to those games, I was going in as favourite for a few events and I kept getting touched out. I kept winning silvers and bronze, which is, was still great. But it got to like day nine and I really wanted to win a gold medal. <laughs> and um, it was my last ever individual event at the games. And um, I all of a sudden, like before that race, had a whole bunch of self-doubt come over me, which had never happened before. Wow. And I was questioning like my abilities. I was questioning why I was there. I was questioning if I was good enough. And I just got really negative and I never have been a negative person. And it shocked me a little bit. And 
It was the first time I'd ever experienced those thoughts and feelings. And it was a lot for me to have to overcome within half an hour because I had like half an hour until I had to walk out onto pool deck. And it was a real like mental battle for me just to be able to walk out onto pool deck. And I did. And I kind of just backed myself and got in and, and won the gold medal. And it was just like this overwhelming sense of relief. But I kind of look back and I'm a little bit disappointed that I put that much pressure on me because like I said, like I should just be proud anyway, no matter what I've done, because I had done, I, to that point, I had done everything that I could to put myself in the best position. I didn't really need a gold medal to validate that. But I think that's what I've enjoyed about being an athlete for such a long time is that I've learned so much on the experiences on like, how to be really kind to myself, how to feel self-worth anyway, regardless of what the result is. And um, yeah, that was definitely a big learning curve for me, but that was my favorite because I learned so much about myself in like the space of an hour. That's amazing that you had so much self-doubt, so close to a race, you were then able to turn that around and achieve something incredible uh, and get your first, or the the gold medal that that you're after. Can you share with us what you actually did? What strategies in your mind did you uh, use to overcome that doubt and that fear and actually walk out, start the race and compete so well? Yeah, like it's really tricky when you come across a situation like that. Like I'm not entirely sure why, but it seems like one of your body's defenses in preparing you to fail is to make you think really negatively about yourself because it's almost like you're softening the blow before the event even happens. So that if in case I didn't win, I was like, well, I kind of already knew that, you know? (laughs) And so I think it's kind of like a defense mechanism when you start speaking really negatively to yourself. Um, And so it's kind of like your body's way of protecting itself. But at the same time, it can be very overwhelming to have those thoughts. And so for me in that time, I just had to try and replace every single negative thought, I had to acknowledge that it was there in the first place. I'd be like, all right, I hear you, but that's not true. (laughs) And I had to try and like implement a positive phrase to replace every single negative thought that I was having. So I would think, you know, Ellie, you're not good enough to be here. And then I would say, I hear you, but I am the world record holder in this event. So I am good enough to be here. And so I had to kind of go through that process to myself. And then I just took a deep breath and said, what if this does work out? Like, you've got to give yourself a chance. And then like, that is all that it took. And then I I kind of went out and did my thing. (laughs) Awesome. So for the kids out there watching and listening, self-doubt happens to all of us, even to someone like yourself, uh, Ellie Cole, uh, world record holder right before a race. uh, And, you know, little strategies like positive self-talk can get you out of that and into the the positive frame of mind and, and help you go on. Uh, and achieve success. And, you know, kids always have self-doubt, especially when they're trying something new. Um, they might be swimming for a while and they might be standing on the starting blocks in a final for their first ever final and they're going to have that self-doubt. So just little things like that, little messages you've shared there, Ellie, can uh, can be the difference in them um, competing well or, or competing not so well or, or just having the confidence to just get out and do their thing. Yeah, and I think there's like a really important message in that because I remember being younger and starting to swim and I saw my heroes, which are like Grant Hackett and Patria Thomas back in those days. And I would think that they were invincible and I would think that they were superheroes, but they're not. <laughs> no, like people that you look up to in sport aren't superheroes. They're everyday people who have just been doing their craft for such a long time. And trust me, they experience self-doubt. So it's nice to know if you're a kid out there and you are feeling that way, that you're definitely not alone. It Just because you're saying negative things about yourself doesn't mean that you're not any good at what you do. Everybody says those things about themselves. It's just a matter of trying to reframe those thoughts, trying to just get up and do yourself proud anyway, regardless of that. And so like that's why that gold medal was my favorite because I was able to get up. I was able to reframe those negative messages and like the amount of pride in myself after that, just because I was able to do that was really great. Awesome. And you would have been pretty exhausted too. <laughs> I was exhausted. Day like 10 days of racing is really tiring. <laughs> Absolutely. Now talk to me about your medals. Where do you keep them at home? Have you got a whole wall dedicated or have you got a whole room dedicated? There's that many. No. <laughs> no. In a drawer? Well, I'm kind of like, I live in an apartment now and I'm saving for a house, which takes a really long time. And so when I I move from this place to the next one, I will get them all framed and put them up on the wall. 
But for now, I know that I will probably only be living here for another year. And so they're all under my bed at the moment. Okay. <laughs> at, least they, at least you know where they are. They're nice and safe. I do need to do a stock check, actually. I haven't checked to see if they're all there for quite a long time. <laughs> well, when you've got 17 medals, a stock take is probably a thing you need to do because you don't want them well, to, to get... Yeah, my off. sister got in touch with me last year and she's like, I have one of your gold medals in my linen closet. And I was like, what is that doing there? And it was back when I lived with her for like six months and I must have just put it there and forgotten about it. And so wow. I was like, oh, okay, I need to be a bit more accountable for my things. Yeah. <laughs> Also a lesson for the kids. <laughs> yes, take care of your stuff. That's it. Now, Ellie, there's no doubt been some other amazing career highlights apart from all the Paralympic medals. What's been another highlight for you in your career? Uh, a highlight for me in my career, it, above all of the medals actually, was carrying the flag at the closing ceremony for the, at Tokyo. Um, for me, that was a huge honour. Obviously, only only one or two people are able to carry the flag and get selected by our chef de mission, who was at the boss of our team. Yep. But for me, it was a really nice way to finish up my Paralympic career. It was a really nice way for me to represent Australia one last time um, and you know carry a flag of a country that I I adore so much. <laughs> and so to be able to do that was really special. And and then it was it was actually. Not necessarily like the flag carrying that was really special. It was more like the moment that I got to spend with my Australian team right before I got on the bus to go to the closing ceremony. It's kind of like we got to the end of Tokyo. We all congregated together. We all had like this really special moment. And then I kind of just went off to represent them all. And that was really special. Oh, I can only imagine. Um, and a very worthy uh, recipient of, of that selection. Do you remember how um, you were told that you were going to be the flag bearer? Yes, I do remember how I was told. I was actually invited to a fake photo shoot. It wasn't even <laughs> real. Um, because I, I thought this was a photo shoot because I had become the most su successful female Paralympian. And so I was like, okay. But I was a bit annoyed that I had to go to a photo shoot because I was really tired. I just finished competing. So I got my tracksuit on, actually this jacket. And um, I walked to this garden that the photographer was at and he was taking these photos. And I thought that I had heard somebody behind me. So I, I went to the photographer. Oh, you just have to stop taking photos for a second. There's someone in the background. And I went around to turn around and tell the person in the background that was doing a photo shoot here. <laughs> <laughs> and it was our chef de mission, the boss, yeah. who was holding a flag and asked me to be the flag bearer. Oh. And then all of these cameras just like jumped out of the bushes everywhere. Oh. And I felt like I was being ambushed, but it was oh, you were. like, yeah, I was, <laughs> I was being ambushed. Yeah. But it was really special because the, the chef de mission of our Paralympic team is like one of my biggest heroes. Um, the, what she did for us heading into Tokyo, the amount of work that she had to do and then everything kept changing because of COVID. Yeah. Like she's like my professional hero um, and we all respect and admire her so much. And I had I wasn't able to give her a hug in the athlete's village until oh. that moment. And so it was nice because she presented me with a flag and then I finally got to hug her. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Now, Ellie, when were you first inspired to be a Paralympian? I was first inspired to be a Paralympian when I was about 10 or 11 years old. I didn't know the Paralympics existed. I didn't know about Paralympic sport. And then one of my um, PE teachers at primary school said to me that there was a whole like sporting thing out there for people with disabilities. And she told me to watch the Athens Paralympic Games in 2004. And so I switched the TV on and I, I saw athletes on the TV that had one leg. I saw athletes in wheelchairs, athletes with cerebral palsy. And I was like, what is this? Yeah. And I discovered like Paralympic sport. I got, got on the internet back then, which was very different than how it is now. I had to like <laughs> dial in with a modem that cut the phone line out and everything. And I was Googling like who my competitors would be. And then I started following them on the internet before Facebook or Instagram or anything. So it was just reading web pages and whatnot. And um, I started tracking what their times were and I guess assessing my competition. Yeah. <laughs> and it took me like three years until I got to actually race any of them. Um, but yeah, I, it was gave me like a really great goal to work towards, a lot of motivation to work towards. Like I had there at times and all of my world record times, um, like a blue tax to next to my bed so when my alarm went off in the morning for training like the first thing that i would see was like my target times wow and i would yeah i would get out of bed i would be so motivated <laughs> it's great 
And um, yeah, it was just like, that was just such a really small thing to do, like to write a goal down and have it somewhere where I saw it every morning, somewhere where I could see it every day. Um, you know, you can put it anywhere next to your bed, you can put it next to the toilet, on your fridge, like yeah. anywhere, as long as you see it every day. And yeah, that made a really big difference. Oh, how good. Uh, who's your your favorite or your most uh, influential athlete of all time? Para or able-bodied? Oh, my favorite athlete of all time. That's a hard one. Who's yours? Oh, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Simple, <Come> really. <laughs> um, I, I'm a bit biased to say that my favorite athlete of all time would have to be Natalie Detour, who I raced against. But I, I would say that she's well deserving of this title of my favorite athlete of all time, because she redefined what Paralympic swimming was when I was younger. She used to be an able-bodied swimmer and then lost her leg. And then when she joined Paralympic sport, she just broke all of the, like smashed all of the world records. Wow. And um, she really rose the bar of Paralympic swimming. And then not only did she do that, she went to both at the Olympics and the Paralympics um, in Beijing. So she was one of the very first Paralympic athletes to compete at an Olympic Games as well. Um, and so that was really cool. We actually have an Australian athlete, Melissa Tapper, um, who went to the Rio Games yep. and the Tokyo Games, both in the Olympics and the Paralympics. So yep. if you want to look her up, she's a really great table tennis player that we have. Oh, she's an Olympian and a Paralympian. She's really impressive. Very I, impressive. I, she, I, I versed her in table tennis and it was not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's pretty good, so I'm not surprised. Yeah, that's the yeah. funny thing. When you have like a lot of friends who are an Olympian or Paralympian, you kind of want to verse them in the sport, but you know they're going to crush you anyway. I don't know. It's like this weird thing that we do to ourselves. <laughs> but did you verse her in the pool? No, I should have done that. It's, it's a bit, it's not really as accessible as a table tennis table. Like I had to actually take a to to do that, but yeah. that's a great idea. I'm going to do that. <laughs> Just so you can get one each. <laughs> <laughs> Make me feel better about myself. Yeah. Hey, Ella, you're an incredible athlete, and I know you train with Olympic champions Kate and Bronte Campbell. What, um, for the kids out there, or for, for, the, for the adults as well, the grown-ups that are watching, what is the difference between training in a Paralympics um, swimming program and an able-bodied program? Is there any difference? Um, there's not too much difference. So I, I trained in a Paralympic program all the way up until like two years ago and then I really wanted a, a good challenge and so why not join two of the best Olympic swimmers in the world yeah. and train with them. Um, that was very challenging actually. Yeah. I probably bit off a bit, bit more than I could chew with that um, but I really enjoyed the challenge like every day was really hard because I was trying to keep up with able-bodied Olympians um, but in terms of the way we approach training it's not any different. Um, the 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 work ethic that we put into our training is not any different. The goals are exactly the same. We want to swim as fast as we can. The only difference is that the rest cycles that we have throughout our training sessions are much smaller um, because they're obviously faster. And so there was plenty of times where I would touch the wall and I'd have maybe three or four seconds rest before I mm. had to go again. But I, I liked that challenge. It made me really fit. Um, yeah. Like the fittest I've ever been was going into Tokyo. And so it was nice to, to be able to stand up on the blocks in Tokyo and be like, this is the fittest and strongest I've ever been because I've been swimming nonstop for the last three years without any rest. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a tough thing to do. I have no doubt. And what, what are... Um... What are some of the main things that you learned from training with the likes of the Campbell sisters at the top of their game, elite elite swimmers? Yeah, I learned that you really have to have a passion, like you have to follow that passion. If you, if you want to put that amount of work in and that hard work in, then having the passion for it in the beginning is so important because it makes the job a lot easier. You know, when I was getting smashed every single day, I could kind of laugh it off a little bit because I was like, well, luckily I love swimming. Yeah. Um, so that was really important. Also, I learned a lot about friendship in that group because we were all at such a high level in our sport. There was a lot of pressure in particular on the Campbell sisters because they're in the media every single day. Paralympic athletes aren't in the media as much and that's a bit of a silver lining. Like we kind of get to fly under the radar a little bit. But, you know, those two girls had a lot of pressure on them heading into Tokyo. And so you really had to learn about what your boundaries were, how you could support each other in the best way possible. When things weren't going to plan, like what could you do as a friend to make their life easier? Um, so that relationship there was really important. 
I also learned a lot about time management um, because like I mentioned, we train six hours a day. And so, you know, we had to, I guess, look ahead at what the next year would look like and communicate any issues that we had with either work or school or university, um, as well as family. And yeah, there was a lot of time management there as well. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of lessons there and uh, it was really, it was a really tough experience. I'm going to be completely upfront with you, but it was easily by far the most rewarding experience because like, I don't know, I just, like I said, <laughs> I've mentioned many times today, I was just so proud of myself at the end for getting to the end. Um, and so that was really rewarding. That's great. And nothing in life comes easy. So no. you need to have those tough experiences if you want to improve and, um, and be at the top of your game. Um, I love that you touched on um, friendship um, mm. because swimming, for the most part, it's quite an individual sport. You're out there, you know, chasing the black line by yourself, but it's actually not quite, you know, you've, you train with, with friends, you've got your coaches, you've got your support crew around you. How important is it to have such a really good team around you as a swimmer? It's really important. And that's the thing that people don't understand when I'm stepping up on the blocks is that there are like literally a hundred people behind me that have made such an impact into where I, how I got there in the first place. Um, so, you know, not only do you have like your professional team, but it's the friendships that are really important because like I've been swimming now on the Australian team for almost 17 years, a really long time. And I've raced 10,000 races, let's just say 10,000. Wow. Um, now, 9,800 of those races haven't gone well. <laughs> <laughs> to put it into perspective, you know, there's something that I've been like, well, I really need to work on that. Um, and sometimes, you know, if you're not managing your personal life very well and you're not competing well either, that can really get you down. You know, you start feeling a bit worthless. You do start thinking quite negatively and so you need really strong friends around you that understand what you're going through that are going to just help guide you through those times because eventually you're going to feel better but you need people there next to you to kind of help guide you through that a little bit and um yeah so like I haven't done a personal best time since 2015 seven years I've been working for and I haven't done a personal best time and so like when people think of athletes, they think of all of the glory and all of the good times. And to be honest, like there are a lot of times where you push yourself and you learn a lot about yourself. But in terms of glory, that only happens 0.0001% of the time. Um, and so it's, you know, it's messy, it's challenging and you need people there that are going to help you through it as well. That's life in general, isn't it? And that's life. <laughs> yeah, very good. In a very intense form. Yeah. Um, now, the Paralympic movement, it's come a, a long way. It's come along in leaps and bounds. Um, Paralympic, Paralympic medalists now get paid the same as Olympians, which is sensational. It's so good. Um, Australian, that is. What have um, been some of the other major changes that you've seen throughout your Paralympic career? Um, I, I would have to say, well, the, the medal bonuses were really fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> I wish that happened 17 medals I ago. I know. Don't they don't back um, that? No, they don't backdate it. <laughs> That's okay. As long as it continues from here on in, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, the equality in terms of the financial support was really wonderful. But for me, that meant so much to me because I, I was recognised as an equal, more so by our government. And that was what I was so proud of because you've got to think, I've been swimming, like I said, for 17 years and never once up until that moment in time have I ever been seen as an equal. And for me, like, that's really hard. And it doesn't just extend out to people that have disabilities. You know, you, you have people that are from different cultures and different backgrounds, different socioeconomic status, different disabilities, different capabilities. And everybody does get treated differently. I'm not entirely sure why. But in Paris sport, we always got treated differently to the Olympic guys. And it was really disheartening because like I trained alongside Kate and Bronte. I did exactly the same work as they did. Yeah. And then when I went to a swimming competition, I was treated so differently. And yeah, I feel like I have a lot of self-worth because I had to create that for myself because I was treated so differently all my life. But, you know, I've seen what the Paralympics has done in such a positive light anyway. Like on the world stage, if you think 
back in 2008 when I first started Paralympic sport, no one really knew what the Paralympics was to start with, but I was I always looked differently. And so if a kid approached me on the street and said to me like, mum, what's wrong with her? The mum would usually, or mum or dad, sorry, would usually get quite offended or the parent or guardian would get quite, of, not offended, but embarrassed that their child had questioned or was curious about my disability. Fast forward to like 2020, if a kid now asks their parent or guardian, what's wrong with me or why do I look different? Instead of shying away from the question or shying away from the topic, I now get approached by said child with their guardian to explain my disability, explain why it's different, explain why it's cool. And then they always see that I have muscles and go, are you a Paralympian? Mm. <laughs> and that's always really lovely. Like just to be able to see people having that conversation around disability, actually being comfortable with having the conversation rather than being embarrassed by it. Um, so just seeing that alone and seeing like what the Paralympics has done in that space is so important because it's okay to have the conversation. If you see somebody who's different, it's okay to say, hey, can you explain to me a little bit more about how your wheelchair works or why you need crutches? Um, you know, the people that you're asking, they know they have a disability. You're not going to surprise them in any way. Um, but if anything, they're going to help educate you on, on how you can manage their disability, how you can make their life easier, um, or just raise general awareness about it. And the more awareness that we have of people who are different to us, I think the better. That's really good. So for the parents that might be watching this or listening to this with their kids and their, their kids um, see someone with a disability out in public, you encourage the kids to, um, to talk to their parents or their parents to talk to yourself or the person with a disability and ask those questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I'm very comfortable and I know a lot of people with disabilities are very comfortable with people who, who want to come up and educate themselves or educate their kids or educate their family members. Like it doesn't, it doesn't worry me at all. It takes three or four minutes out of my day and it could change the way that a child approaches someone with a disability for the rest of their life. So I'm more than happy to do that. Perfect. Now you were part of the Netflix documentary, Rising Phoenix. How was that experience? And do you think it's helping uh, project the Paralympic movement to a, to a whole new level? Yeah, it's kind of weird being on Netflix. Yeah. Tell you that. Um, I didn't realize that when I was filming Rising Phoenix that it was going to be on Netflix in 180 wow. countries. Um, but it was really cool. So they, they launched this documentary that I was part of. It, it showcases nine different athletes, I believe. I think it's nine. Um, and their stories. And then the history of the Paralympics, um, the issues that we've faced in the Paralympics. And they launched this documentary on the day that the Paralympics were supposed to happen in 2020. Um, when everything got postponed and so for me it was wonderful to be able to watch this documentary because it kind of filled in that paralympic gap that i was feeling that void yeah. <laughs> in 2020 but it was strange um seeing yourself like i said in a netflix documentary i saw a whole bunch of home video that i'd never seen before wow. for the first time with like millions of other people so that was strange wow. but the reception that i got from people after that documentary aired you know, they were messaging me being like, I can't believe that Paralympians were treated so differently in the past. And I was like, well, it's always been that way. And I think that's why people were so excited to help out with our pay parity and equal pay for Tokyo, because they never realized that we were treated differently. Like they just didn't have any awareness of it. It's not that they didn't want to help. They just didn't know that they needed to. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was a really wonderful way to create some awareness there. Nice to shine a spotlight on it. Well-deserved attention. Yeah, it was yeah. nice. Okay, Ellie, so four Paralympics, do you have a favourite? Yes, my favourite Paralympics by far has been Tokyo. Cool. Uh, like I mentioned, just landing, like I remember being on the charter flight, we, we get our own plane to go to the Paralympics with. Nice. And um, I remember getting on the plane with my team and finally landing in Tokyo, like 365 days after we were supposed to. And I remember the plane just touching down and everyone was so happy just to be there. And it was just like, it was just such a celebration before the competition started. Like we were already celebrating. We were like, we weren't taking that moment for granted at all. Um, we were like, just so in the moment as a team together, just so appreciative of the movement. So appreciative that the games were going ahead. Like it was, if I didn't even compete there, that game sort of be my favorite games. Like, <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was so great. And is that because do you think that's because it was it was so much more difficult you had to wait a whole another 12 months is that part yeah. of it yeah oh yeah like training in for an extra year was really hard 
Um, it was really, really tough. And it, it wasn't necessarily training for an extra year that was tough. The tough bit was um, we, we had no idea that games were actually going to happen until two weeks before they did. Wow. And so, yeah, the games they said they're postponed for 12 months, but they could have been canceled at any moment. And it was looking likely because the COVID cases across the world were climbing and climbing and climbing. And we were thinking as athletes, like at, at what point are they going to pull the pin? Like, are they going to pull the pin at 10 million cases? Are they going to pull the pin at 12 million cases? And so we were training every day and giving our best every day. Like training is really hard. You know, the amount of times that you want to throw up and just stop is <laughs> like, it happens five or six times a week. Oh, wow. Feeling like that. And so you're pushing yourself to the absolute limit every day, but you weren't really sure if the games were going to happen. And so there are plenty of times when we were like, why am I doing this? Yeah, I bet. <laughs> and so that was the hard bit. It was like, it was, it was giving it your all, but not really being sure that there was anything to give your all for. Yeah, that would be yeah. very difficult. And so things like uncertainty of whether the Paralympics were even going to happen, you know, pre-race doubt, you've had two shoulder reconstructions. How do you mentally get through those really difficult times? Yeah, there's like, there's been a lot of challenges that I've had as an athlete, like COVID being one, you know, breaking my foot being another, breaking my hip last year was another one. Um, double shoulder reconstruction. Also like, yeah, my seven year dry spell when it comes to a personal best time. Yeah. Um, think, you know, it can get really overwhelming when you are on this like path to something and then something will throw you completely off that pathway or something will just completely stop you. Um, and that happens a lot in life. You know, you never just start it on a journey and it's all fairies and unicorns to the end. That <laughs> never happens. And so for me, whenever something bad happens to me in my swimming career, like my first step is to, okay, how can we make this better? Because the, the moment that it happens, that's going to be the, the, the worst position that you're going to be in is the moment that something bad happens to you. So it can really only get better from there <laughs> nice. if you keep working at it. And then whenever I'm feeling really overwhelmed, a really great tactic that I used a lot heading into Tokyo was asking myself, what can I do better today to put me in the best position tomorrow? <laughs> and so it was kind of like not looking ahead, just literally doing whatever you can in that moment, in that day to make yourself better. And then that that's all you can do. And knowing that that's all you can do um, makes, I don't know, it just kind of takes the, the, the weight off you nice. uh, because you're just doing the best that you can with what you have. Yeah, got to control what you can control. Yeah, that's a big part of swimming too, control what you can control. It's amazing when you race in an Olympics or Paralympics, you like don't even worry about the person in the lane next to you. And you saw like, you saw, I, I remember watching our Olympic swim team, the amount of times where I was like, oh my gosh, they are so far behind, the Australians. I was like, oh my gosh, they are so far behind. But then in their race plan, like they would just come over the top of all of the other swimmers in the last lap because they were just doing their thing. Um, yeah, so it's fascinating when you watch the Olympics because the athletes actually don't care about what the person in the lane next to them is doing. They're just controlling what they can control. And I love watching that. <laughs> yeah, awesome. It feeds perfectly into a, a, a listener question that we've got in from a little fan. Speaking of watching other um events this one's from lucy she's nine years old and she's from queensland and she said when you're not competing do you enjoy watching other paralympic sports and what's your favorite yes i love watching other paralympic sports so much when i'm not competing all i do is watch the paralympics so i was watching the paralympics like non-stop when i was in tokyo on my laptop in my on my cardboard bed of all things <laughs> um i've got a few favorite sports wheelchair basketball is one of them because i play it myself um, also wheelchair rugby because it's like, it's just aggressive and Crazy. I don't know, they kind of just put their all into it and I just love that. I also really enjoy watching um, the Paralympic sport of goalball, which you may not have heard of. It's yeah. only in the Paralympics, it's not in the Olympics, but it's a sport for vision impaired athletes and they basically have like a ball in it, like a volleyball, like a volleyball sized ball with a bell and then they have to like cheer for this ball. <laughs> And the teams are throwing it from one end to the other, trying to score goals. It's really cool. Um, so I find that really impressive. Yeah, they're probably my three favorite and swimming. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, just speaking of goal ball, how good were the bells? Oh my gosh. 
my favorite, one of my favorite moments from Tokyo because our Aussie Bells, who are a um, female goalball team, they had never won a Paralympic Games match in their whole Bells history. Yeah. And in, in Tokyo, they won their very first Paralympic match. And <laughs> I remember I was in the elevator at the Athletes Village and they all came into the elevator and they told me that they'd won and we all just like held each other and jumped up and down in this elevator. <laughs> and I was just like, well, okay, you guys, safety, safety. <laughs> But it was one of my favorite moments because like we all just felt so much joy in that moment. Oh, how good that you could you could share that enjoyment with them. Yeah, it was wonderful. They felt like, who's this swimmer? <laughs> I, I highly doubt they thought that. Now, I Ellie, did. if you weren't a an incredibly talented swimmer, what sport would you love to be really good at? Um, tennis, okay. <laughs> probably. Yeah. I used to play a bit of tennis. Um, Able bud style though on my legs. Whereas I think I really enjoy being part of wheelchair tennis. And the reason why I say that is because you get to go to like the Australian Open, you get to go to the French Open, the US Open and Wimbledon. And I think I'd really enjoy those grand slams. Um, yeah, I think just tennis would be a really cool sport to play. More for like the competitions and things like that. Yeah, because it's pretty much year round, you get to travel the world. Um... Pretty and then go to the Paralympics as well. So you get the best of everything. Absolutely. Dylan Alcott's lucky in that respect, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> now, what's the, what does the future hold for you, Ellie? I know that you've retired from the Paralympics, but will we see you at the Commonwealth Games? Yes. So yes. Commonwealth Games next year. Yes. <laughs> I get back into training tomorrow morning, actually. Okay. Um, for that. I haven't swum a stroke since Tokyo, so that's going to be interesting. So yeah, Commonwealth Games is next year and then I'll be looking to retire from swimming completely after Commonwealth Games. Um, so I'll be 30, which is a really great age, I think, to retire. Yep. Um, kind of like starting a new decade fresh. Nice. And then I'll be work I'll still work in swimming. Like I'll be involved. My goal is to go to every single Paralympics for the rest of my life. Nice goal. Maybe not, maybe not as an athlete, but in a professional sense as well. Um, just like different capacity. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I really want to keep going to the Paralympics in some way. And I want to work in a bit more in the world of disability because as an athlete with a disability, I think I have a very skewed sense of what having a disability actually means. Um, whereas I kind of want to learn about the real life experiences of you know, real life people that have disabilities. And so I'm really excited to learn more about that next year. Yeah, beautifully said. Look forward to following that journey and seeing where you end up, Ellie. Now, if you, <laughs> if you could go back and give uh, one piece of advice to eight-year-old Ellie, what would it be? Um, always enjoy yourself mm. and follow your intuition. I'd have to say it would be a really good piece of advice because, you know, I, I've always followed just what makes me happy, what I'm really passionate about. And I've always been very fulfilled in what I've done. And there have been a few times where I guess my direction has been influenced by other people who may have ulterior motives of some type. And it's made me feel a bit uncomfortable, but I've done, I've, I've gone down the wrong path anyway. And I've always ended up in that moment, really unhappy with what I was doing. And I end up just kind of finding my own way back to what I love anyway. Um, except, you know, in hindsight, I kind of wish that I just, yeah, followed my intuition a bit more and just followed those passions all the time. So I'd, I'd say that would be my advice. That's great. And it's great advice for eight-year-old Ellie, but also the eight-year-olds and the other kids out there watching that. Just do what you love. Stick to what you love and you'll you'll find more success. Yes. That's so interesting as you get older and you go from being a kid into a teenager and then a teenager, teenager into an adult. Like there are so many people out there that really want to help you, which is wonderful. But there are so many people out there that kind of want to influence you in a certain way or make you like certain things or dislike certain things. And um, yeah, you kind of always have to just sit back and be like, what do I actually like? What do I actually dislike? And then you just follow that. I like it. Now, Ellie, we're just going to change the pace here. We've got some quick fire questions. I'm not good at these. <laughs> oh, they're pretty easy. I reckon okay. you'll find them pretty easy. So, Vegemite or peanut butter? Oh, peanut butter, 100%. I read yesterday that Vegemite <laughs> is mostly made out of discarded beer yeast. Yeah. I read that mm. on a trivia that I did last night. Wow, that's, that's uh, that is interesting. I didn't know that. Um, and also celery. It's got celery in it. That's bizarre. <laughs> 
I hope kids don't get turned off eating Vegemite just after learning those facts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Wonder Woman or Batgirl? <laughs> that is such an easy question. <laughs> Wonder Woman, for Hands sure. Down. <laughs> Dogs or cats? Dogs, I got two. Nice. What I didn't even know how to hold a cat. Um, Franklin and Lacey, they're two chihuahuas. Very it was Lacey's cool. birthday yesterday, actually, so she got very spoiled. Happy birthday, Lacey. Yeah, I sang a happy birthday already, like all nice. day yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> now, Milo, is it hot or cold? Cold. Yeah, nice. Because like, the thing is, if you're going to have a hot chocolate, you really should use hot chocolate powder because then it's more decadent, if that makes sense. Whereas Milo, cold Milo is like refreshing. <laughs> Great lessons for the kids, Ellie. <laughs> Would you rather be able to fly or be invisible? Or, I'm just trying to think. If I f- could fly, I would travel places faster. I feel like the only thing that I would get up to if I was invisible would be mischief. <laughs> and so I'm going to say fly because I want to be a good girl. Well considered answer. <laughs> um, would you prefer a pet dinosaur or a pet dragon? Dragon. Okay, wait, I changed my last answer then. I want to be invisible and I'll have a pet dragon so that I can fly on my pet dragon. Around. There you go. I like it. Would you rather be the funniest person alive or the smartest person alive? Smartest, 100%. Beach or snow? <laughs> uh, I'm going to say snow because it doesn't get everywhere like sand does. Oh, far out. Yeah. Well considered answers. Sneakers or thongs? I want to know what your answer is going to be too. Um, it's not about me. I would go sneakers only because wearing thongs with a prosthetic is really hard because we don't have like the toe grip that everybody else has. Yep. And so like I'll just be walking and my, my thong will just like fly off somewhere. I was like, oh, and then i got to put it back on again. Frustrating, eh? Yeah. Okay, the big one, rice bubbles or wheat bix? Wheat bix because... They, uh, I'd say they're nutritionally better for you. And I'm an athlete and I eat really well. Very also, good. Also, if you had weedy bites. Yeah. They're my favorite. I only got into them like six months ago, but I've converted like 15 people onto them. The apricot With ones. Little bits of apricot. And- yes, so good. Oh, delicious. How many wheat bix are you eating in one bowl? I haven't tried that since I was about 10, but I think I might be able to get through like only six. Okay. And how do you have them? Just with milk and a bit of... Well, how many can you eat? Gee whiz, it's been a while since I've tried a, a Wheat Bix okay. challenge. But when I was a kid, yeah, I probably went about 12. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, I I like having just a little bit of milk because I do like a bit of crunchiness to them. Yeah. Are you just leaving them whole or do you crunch them up? Um, I would eat them whole. Yeah. <laughs> Crunching them up would just be too messy. <laughs> yeah. Well, you I like get a bit of milk. water in my life. Wheat Bix included. Very good. That's why you're so successful, Ellie. Probably. Probably not. We're going to play a quick game. I'm conscious of your time, but let's play a quick game because this, this is going to be fun. It's an alphabet game. Okay. And I'm going to name an animal and a location. It can be a place, a country, city, anywhere. And you've got to go in the alphabet. So I'll start at A, then you go B. And oh, you go I'm so bad at geography. We're going to, okay. we're about to find out. Okay, so an ant in Antarctica. A bat in Bolivia. Is Bolivia a place? Absolutely, it is. Yeah, I don't know where it is. A uh, a crocodile in Cuba Pedi. Oh, I like Cuba Pedi. A dingo in Diagon Alley. <laughs> no, a dingo in Denmark. <laughs> Where's Diagon Alley? Isn't that in Harry Potter, or is it? Oh, okay. I'm with you. What are we up to, D? E. Uh, elephant in England. F, uh, fawn, like a fawn, you know, the little deer things. Oh, yeah. That count? Absolutely. I'll just say frog, just to make it easy. Frog in France. Okay. Uh, gibbon on the Gold Coast. You're going very Australian, aren't you? Well, I'm Aussie. (laughs) A hedgehog (laughs) in H. Hobart. Are you phoning a friend there? No. <laughs> Speak quite more quietly. You're out. You cheated. 
<laughs> I know that really goes against my morals. I shouldn't have done that. No, that's that's a lot of fun. Thank you for playing that <laughs> game with me. You had some good answers. I like the fawn. We haven't had the fawn before. Ah, good. Okay, Ellie, we're going to finish with Aussie's final question. Now, my favourite saying is stay keen. That's what I try and teach the kids to try lots of things. Find out what you love. And if you set your sights on something, you can achieve it if you just stay keen. So, Ali, how do you stay keen? Oh, gosh. I stay keen by always having like a picture in my mind of where I want to go. It's perfect. I would say that. <laughs> it's a perfect answer. It's very simple and kids will understand that and hopefully they'll hold on to that and and understand that that kind of uh, that kind of method of staying keen results in success just like you have achieved in all aspects of your life, Ellie. And I look forward to seeing where you go after your swimming career. I want to watch you one more time swim at the Commonwealth Games next year. One then, more time. <laughs> then beyond that, I look forward to seeing where you go. I thank you so much for your time today, Ellie. It was wonderful. Thank you for the chat. I had so much fun. Yeah, good to and hear. And now I'm going to go and read a bit more on geography, I think. <laughs> I think you did pretty well. I only got to H, but thank you. That's okay. You, your friend helped you out there. I know. I think I'm going to go now and have a Milo and a Wheat Bix. <laughs> well, you enjoy your cold Milo and your Wheat Bix. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Until then, stay keen, Ellie. Bye. If you haven't already, make sure you get a grown up to help you hit that subscribe button. That way you won't miss out on any of the new and exciting videos that we put out. Speaking of new and exciting, if there's a video that you'd love to see Aussie do, make sure you send us a message on our socials, on Facebook or Instagram at Aussie for Kids. We'll see you again soon, kids. And until then, stay keen. Oh, and by the way, did you happen to find the hidden Aussie icon in that video? Yeah, make sure you look closely because they're in every single video. That's right, stay keen, kids. Ozzy, 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 Oi! Ozzy is a friend of yours and he's a friend